Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to discuss MELIS, a type of mitochondrial genetic disease. MELIS stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. MELIS became a matter of medical record in 1975, although who can be officially credited with the discovery is a little vague. MELIS seemed to fly under the radar until suddenly three different research facilities began three different independent studies and all published their results at about the same time. All three claimed to be first discovery using terms like original case and a new disease in their publications, but I was unable to find a third party report, article, or journal from that time period conclusively validating which one really picked up the study first. Those teams were Gardner Medwin, Shapira and Coensberger. Each study used test groups rather than individuals, so we aren't really able to conclusively point to a first known individual case. Inheritance type. While most human DNA is located in the nucleus of the cell, mitochondria have their own DNA as well. Regular DNA comes in long chains that are tightly coiled into strands, but mitochondrial DNA forms rings instead. It is not contained within a nucleus and instead floats around the mitochondrial body, looking kind of like loose rubber bands. We already know that DNA is coded by combinations of base pairs, that adenine binds with thymine and cysteine binds with guanine. These combinations are pretty much the four-letter alphabet that accounts for all of our DNA coding. However, it is possible for the nucleotides to shift position, creating opportunities for hydrogen bonds that do not normally exist. These are pretty rare, especially since these bindings require more energy than normal. Additionally, the matchup is messy and doesn't quite fit right, so our en enzymes can usually catch and correct it in time to prevent any actual problems. When those errors persist though, you end up with a point mutation. Mila's syndrome is caused by a point mutation in the MTTL1 gene at section M3240, which is located in this small segment of the mitochondrial genome called LUUR. If this particular error in this particular place escapes detection, it becomes what is called a pathogenic mutation, meaning that it causes harm to the individual. There are actually 30 or so mutations of the mtDNA that can cause the same set of problems as MELIS, but M3240 accounts for 80% of all MELIS cases, so for medical purposes, it's the main diagnostic cause and the first thing they screen for. Diagnosis of MELIS syndrome. MELIS is a complicated disease that requires tiered testing, but the primary method is by extracting mitochondrial DNA from white blood cells and scanning section M3240 to see if there is an A to G pairing using polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Here are some pictures of actual PCR equipment. The vials are a little bit unique and the machine is kind of fascinating looking, so I thought it might be fun for us to get to take a peek at it. Our second diagnostic tool is to biopsy muscle tissue to look for rough, ragged red fibers. Samples of muscle tissue were taken for biopsy and dyed blue with Gamori trishrom stain. Faulty mitochondria tend to gather in clumps in the muscle tissue and look like rough red fibers that are visible under a microscope. An A1C blood glucose test is also performed to eliminate diabetes as a factor. Because diabetes may cause similar muscle damage due to complications from ketoacidosis. Both lactic acidosis and ketoacidosis change the pH level of your blood and cause corrosive damage to tissue and organs. Individuals suffering from MELIS have flawed mitochondria that are unable to efficiently use oxygen or provide enough energy for the cells, which leads to chronic dysfunction of cells all over the body. This causes serious damage over time. Additionally, a waste product produced by the mitochondria is considered a free radical. 
Our mitochondria's job is to use oxygen to break down energy from food into something our bodies can use. In cases of Miele's syndrome, this process is impaired and on the most basic scale, it simply means that the cells are not receiving enough energy. The first presenting symptoms of Miele's are usually chronic fatigue, disorientation, and frequent migraines. Over time, these starving cells can lead to tissue death. The body parts most drastically affected are the brain, digestive system, muscle fibers, heart, eyes, and inner ears. Because there is tissue death all through the body, neurological dysfunction is prevalent in individuals suffering from Miele's. Neuroimaging shows that lesions of the brain are common enough to be considered hallmark phenotypes of this disorder, as well as low IQ, early onset dementia, stroke-like episodes, and temporary paralysis. Retinal dystrophy, cataract, and complete blindness are common, as well as significant hearing loss. Lactic acid builds up in the mus muscle tissues, threatening the fibers and heart. The inability to effectively expel all that lactic acid leads to digestive issues, as well as regular nausea, colitis, constipation, and or inflammatory bowel syndrome. One of the first early signs of Miele's is onset of constant migraines, nausea, vomiting, and muscle weakness. Miele's syndrome is progressive and terminal. Sadly, at our current level of available medical science, there is no cure. All we're really able to do is treat the symptoms and provide comfort. Speech and physical therapy may help individuals recover some function between episodes, and medication can be used to lessen the frequency and severity of events, but the lactic acidosis complicates the type of anticonvulsant drugs that can be used. There are no treatments available to correct the actual mitochondrial dysfunction, and so we currently lack a method to mitigate the underlying cause of this condition. Fortunately, Miele's is a rare disease. For every 100,000 individuals in a population, only an estimated 0.18% will have the pathogenic M3240 mutation in that population per year. Although inherited maternally, the genetic disorder affects men and women at equal rates, but a family history may increase the risk. Miele's sounds like a living nightmare, and it's just one of many mitochondrial disorders. For people born with this one tiny change to their genetic code, every day is a struggle. But there is hope. Recent success with targeted gene editing of mitochondrial DNA in mice indicates that a possible cure using CRISPR and Cas9 may be on the near horizon in theory. Although the actual practice of altering human genes is currently controversial due to concerns that once we open that door even a little, it might be impossible to close it again. There are those who worry about the direction human social ethics and hierarchy may take if enhanced humans become a reality. In the meantime, there are several awareness groups whose missions are to improve the quality of life for children, adults, and families living with mitochondrial diseases through support, education, outreach, advocacy, clinical research initiatives, and by granting wishes for children affected by mitochondrial disease. Two of the brightest shining examples are Mito Action and the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Both have five stars and 100% ratings on multiple charity watchdog sites, including Charity Navigator. If you're in a position to donate or volunteer, please pay their sites a visit. Links in the description and they are not sponsors. You can also help people with mitochondrial diseases by keeping track of and getting involved with proposed legislation in your area involving the legality of CRISPR and Cas9 technologies. So, in this video, we covered the hereditary genetic disease Milias, which is caused by an A to G point mutation in the mitochondrial DNA. This results in flawed mitochondria that cannot effectively produce energy for the body, causing neurodegenerative symptoms as well as a buildup of lactic acid and multi-system tissue death. 
We discussed how the disease is progressive and terminal, and that symptoms generally present between 2 and 15 years of age, with an expected lifespan of 15 to 18 years beyond that. We covered the limited treatment options and current lack of a cure, but also the hope the medical community is placing in CRISPR and Cas9 for the future. We took a brief look at the hectic race to first publish Discovery in 1975, and finally, we discussed a few organizations that are trying really hard to help and how you can too. I hope this quick look at Mila's syndrome helped you learn something new today. And that's all. Thanks for watching.